Hey, busted. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to another Bleed Lows podcast live. I see we've got some uh, of our peeps with us already. Always good. I'm just warning you right now, if this gets knocked down or I black out, don't be alarmed. We have a new puppy. Okay. My disclaimer in the beginning of the show, I'm Alicia Del Valle. This is the Bleed Lows podcast live. We've got with us Cody Snavely, aka Canelo. Um, we've got Babyface, super producer of the Bleed Lows podcast. And we've got a special guest co-hosting with us tonight. Please, fam, give it up for Juan Toribio, aka uh oh i was trying to think of paul rodriguez's show aka juan pablo something like that i'm, yeah, okay. I'm not so, even drunk i swear <laughs> <laughs> please keep the chats coming we look forward to hanging out with you good evening to doom sal i see you i think he was first you win you win michael negrete Dan danny hi danny finally what's up dodger fam we're here we're here um, we're going to need a Canelo review league update, a rev. My rev. elbow hurts. That's, that's the update. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Jose is asking, where's Juan? Juan is on assignment tonight. So, um, uh, the other Juan, we've got Juan Toribio here. So the Prince of Darkness is not with us this evening. <laughs> Unless Juan Toribio wants to take the plays, you just let us know if you want to be Doomsday. Uh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it up to him. I'll okay, it. okay. <laughs> really good at it, so I'll leave it up to him. Uh, as always, please, everybody joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. If you've been with us before, you know we've got to push. Please subscribe and like our videos. Please tell a friend. And our super chats are always open to you. You can always purchase that super chat. You get in the show. Your chat gets right there highlighted and of course all super chat purchases go to supporting the bleed lows podcast and our um i guess now instead of the korea fund it's the japan fund is that what we're calling it <laughs> next year the japan fund yeah yeah the japan fund so what's up everybody what a great day to be talking dodger baseball because you know who hit a home run <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to talk about Otani's home I'll run. I'll talk about Otani. Yeah, we saw the home run. I mean, obviously, everyone was waiting for the home run to happen. It seemed like Otani was pressed a little bit, um, but he finally ended up getting it right on the last game of the Dodgers' homestand. So um, I think it was good for him to get it out of the way because um, it did – while Otani was hitting the ball hard, I do see some signs of either he was just trying – to live up to, you know, all the hype of coming back to Dodger Stadium or just the hype of the fans, the contract. Um, I've already compared kind of his rehabbing to Bryce Harper last year, where it kind of took Harper a little bit until the middle of the summer to kind of get going, especially with the slugging and, and hitting, you know, doubles and home runs. So um, I think it's a big thing that Otani got, you know, the home run out of the way. But obviously, Otani himself has had so much stuff to deal with in the past two or three weeks. So I think we are starting to realize the guy is human. Um, but the thing is, the Dodgers, they're clicking on all cylinders for the most part. And that's with Otani being one of not their best hitters. Um, and we've seen it firsthand. You know, they're heading to Chicago with a 7-2 and two record. Couldn't ask for anything better. And now, I mean, Juan Toribio can probably attest to it. It's pretty cold in, in Chicago right now. Yeah, he's, I forgot. I left, a, I left it out. You are in Chicago. Thank you for joining us. What time is it there right now, Juan? Uh, it's 9.14, so nice. a couple hours ahead of you guys. Uh, nice, nice. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. It is us. cold. That is true. Yeah. That's why I'm I'm staying in my hotel room as much as possible. I'm going to go <laughs> to the park and from the park back. Uh, I'm from Florida, so this is uh, oh. freezing weather for me. Yeah, that's that's not where your people are from, right? Like, <laughs> not at all. So they call it the Windy City for a reason. Is there also wind there this evening? Because I know it freezes your nostrils. It freezes the hairs in your nostrils, people. Yeah, from the moment <laughs> you get off the plane, like the plane or out of the airport, it gets you right away. Like it's it's a pretty it's a pretty nasty cold, honestly. Like just not 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 very pleasant. I, I can't even imagine trying to play nine innings of baseball. Or even just like sitting in the stands. So, I actually think if the fans who go to the game tomorrow should get like season tickets. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> you Be heard nice. it here. <laughs> you get season tickets if you sit there for nine innings in this cold. Season tickets. Yeah. Minutes. I feel like 
it's kind of unfortunate for the Dodgers because I feel like back to back years they've traveled there really early. Last year was in like the middle of April. This year it's the beginning of April and you know, I like Wrigley because it's a really beautiful stadium to look at even on TV, but not when the Ivy's dead out there and <laughs> players are wearing, you know, covering their entire face up and even here on the East Coast it's it's been extremely cold, windy and rainy up there up north. I, I, it's been the same thing where wind and, and then just the freezing temperatures. So, and that's just not baseball weather. Um, it kind of makes sense, you know, kind of just going into it. Kind of makes sense a little bit why Jason Hayward is probably placed on the IL, you know, right before this series kicked off um, with the back stiffness because at his age going up there to some frigid temperatures, it doesn't mix well. So it definitely gives him some time. So Juan, obviously a lot of things happened over the past couple of days, you know, the Dodgers transaction page, I feel like you could just kept kept refreshing it and it was going to keep updating. So why don't you fill us in on like, you know, some of the moves, obviously we had Hayward, you know, they made some DFAs, released some players. What's everything the Dodgers have been up to the past just couple of days? Yeah. You mentioned it there with Hayward. Um, his back's been locking up here over the last week or so. Uh, so it, I mean, it's April, what is it? Fourth. So they were just kind of like, you know, let's just give him 10 days or so and, and see where he is. Uh, he got some scans done. They were all negative. So that's, you know, that's definitely a positive. Uh, in his place, they did acclaim Taylor Trammell from Seattle. Um, he's mostly just a depth guy until, until Jason Hayward can kind of come back and, and be healthy again. Uh, and then on the pitching side, Nabil Chrismat, uh, he got selected. Uh, pitched pretty well, actually, a couple of innings out of the bullpen, and then got DFA the next day. <laughs> That's just kind of the life in, uh, the life in baseball for some of these uh, pitchers. Uh, and then he got DFA for Denelson Lamette, who got his first career save yesterday. Uh, and he's actually kind of interesting. I just kind of just seeing his slider, it seems like it's a lot more sharp. I mean, obviously, this is a guy who was a top prospect, uh, kind of jumped into the onto the scene with San Diego, and then got injured uh, for over the last couple of years. Uh, so if he can kind of get going for the Dodgers, I think he can be another guy who, you know, somewhere in the system, uh, he could be a pretty valuable piece. And uh, but yeah, I mean, I think Chris Man, I don't think anybody would have would have imagined you know, Bill Chris Man and the Nelson Lamet pitch in the first home set of the season, and they yeah. did. And they both pitched pretty well, so you got to give them some credit. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I didn't think these guys would have been named early on. Maybe in the middle of the summer, you know, dog days of summer hit. You know, you got to get some, you know, innings, you know, relax them a little bit, call up some arms, some fresh arms. And you bring up a good thing about Lamette. You know, when they signed him a little bit before spring training on the minor league deal with an invitation, you know, he did have a really good spring, spring training with a 2.45 ERA, a high strikeout rate. Um, I think he was one of the guys late due to like a visa issue. Um, so yeah. it was good to see him come into the camp kind of ball out. Cause when it was 2020, I get it was the shortened, you know, COVID year. Um, so you can kind of throw some of those regular season stats out the window just because we've seen so many up and downs with players, but he had a 2.09 ERA and then injuries kind of sidelined his career and it pretty much derailed it. And he's been a journeyman around, you know, he's been on multiple NOS teams. I know he was on the Rockies at, Definitely didn't work out up there. You know, he had a 6-12 ERA and I believe 21 and then uh, 22 and 23, you know, in, in the 11. So do you think these – do you think he can probably make a long, long, longer impact on the team right now or do you think he's just filling in right now? I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. If not, not, not that that's a cop-out answer, but I think ultimately the, the Dodgers are waiting for Blake Trinan and Bruiser Gratterall to get back. And, and you know, we obviously saw Gratterall. He's going to be out to at least mid-May. Uh, he just got put on the 60-day IL. But, like, Trinan seems to be a little bit closer than that. Uh, and once they get those guys back, you know, guys like Lamet and Chris Matt, you know, they won't be a as needed. Now, granted, someone could get hurt. Someone probably will get hurt. I mean, that's just kind of the reality of, of being a pitcher. So having guys like Chris Matt, Lamet, Kyle Hurt, who's another guy who obviously in a different bug, he's more of a prospect type. But having guys like that who you can kind of call up they can give you two to three innings uh, over the course of a 162 game season, especially with the Dodgers, right? Like they're not playing for the regular season. Like they're going to be in the playoffs. I, I know, I know they're like, they're like baseball reference thing says like 97%. That's a hundred percent. Yeah. They're, they're going to make the playoffs. So I think regardless of what happens on April 15th, they don't really care. They're just trying to figure out how they can eat up innings 
uh, so they can keep everybody fresh. So, I mean, we kind of saw it already, right? Like, they had a bullpen game. They didn't have to have a bullpen game, but they were just like, you know, let's just give Glass now Yamamoto an extra day because who cares? If we lose a game on April 2nd, it literally means nothing. Uh, and they ended up winning it. So there's always that upside to it. So I think just having guys like that, like I said, uh, it's going to be valuable down the, down the, uh, over the long haul. All right. Yeah. And then I'm kind of interested before I shoot it off to Alicia real quick. Um, cause I think the biggest thing with the Jason Hayward thing, and I saw a lot of people on, you know, on social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook, they were kind of saying, all right, I get putting Hayward on the IL, but why aren't we calling up Andy Pajes? Like, why isn't he getting the call? Why isn't he deserving of the call? And I, I kind of already understand like that he wasn't going to get the call just because if you look at him, you know, he missed all of last season with the injury only has around like 20 career triple a at bats. Um, do you think he makes an impact at some point in this year? And do you kind of understand what the Dodgers are doing where they want him to get playing time regularly in the minor leagues right now? Yeah. I think if everybody stays healthy, he, he we won't see him at all this season. Yeah. Uh, only because is he better than Teoscar Hernandez? No. Uh, it, does he provide what Jason Hayward doesn't in the clubhouse? Also, no. So I think it, people also need to understand he's 23 years old. Like you said, he just came off major shoulder surgery. As good as the spring training as he's had, he still has to prove it down in the minor leagues, even more, even more so, you know, obviously at a triple A level. Uh, and I also think Miguel Vargas is probably somewhere ahead of him in the pecking order in terms of getting a call up uh, if they do need a a fill-in outfielder. If they need someone for, you know, if Teoscar Hernandez, you know, has to miss three months, uh, then maybe you just kind of give the kid a chance and say, well, let's see what you have. But if it's Sunday for 10, 15 days, you, you'll probably see Miguel Vargas come up instead of Andy Pajas. Because like you said, you, he's a guy who's going to probably be your right fielder next year if all things progress the way that they should. Uh, Teoscar Hernandez is on a one-year deal. Jason Hayward's on a one-year deal. Uh, so you want to have him ready for when that time comes. And the best way for him to be ready is to play every single day right now. Uh, and, and, you know, I understand everyone kind of falling in love with the prospects, right, especially during spring training, because uh, that's the time that you see them the most. Uh, but there's a process to these things. And I think as of right now, his best thing for him is to stick, be in the minor leagues and, and keep working through some things. All right. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Michael Carrillo on fire with your questions, uh, Canelo to Juan. Uh, I'll try to condense it, but basically he's calling out Hayward, saying he's not the future of the club. The uh, prospect is better than, clearly better than Hayward in capital letters, yo. Like Michael Carrillo is serious about his comments. <laughs> the thing is, I will, I will say this about Hayward. Like his impact in the clubhouse is enormous. Yes. Uh, like, is he going to be a guy who's probably going to hit 300 for you? Like, that's not who he is at this point in his career. I mean, he, that's not who he's been any year of his career. Uh, but I think if you ask to a man, every single guy in that clubhouse, who the the leader is, the, the vocal, actual leader of the team, not performance, obviously performance, you, you, there's a bunch of guys ahead of him. But in terms of a vocal leader, I think everyone would say Jason Hayward. And that's just not a guy who you can kind of get rid of. Uh, that easily and it, it is a one-year deal and and sure Pajas might be better in the long run but they're not worried about 2025 2026 they have to win right now I mean if they don't win a world series this year it's a failure and the best way that they could do it as like right right now on April 4th is with Jason Hayward on the roster yeah and I don't think the other part of it is that you don't really need another right-handed bat in the lineup to substitute for Hayward you got T Taylor Trammell you know he is like a defensive wizard out there. If there's anything that's a plus side of his major league career, it is his defense. He hits well in the minors. You know, he had a 119 uh, weight is run creative plus, but he just hasn't been able to translate that now. And this guy isn't going to be on the team all year long. Like, obviously, we know that he's out of options. When Hayward comes back, we're more than likely saying goodbye to him. So um, I think you just have to take it like you you mentioned, you know, we need a guy just for the next 10 to 15 days, not for the next, you know, three months. Right. Yeah. And if, if something, like I said, if something happens to Teoscar or Hayward or Altman or whoever, and they need someone for three months, uh, then in that case, either they go out and get someone from the outside or they, they should say, let's just see what he has. Um, the, the last thing you want is for him to come up and get exposed early on. I mean, that just kind of kills a kid's confidence. Yeah. I'm not saying that he will, he would get exposed, but as a young player, you know, we've seen that time and time again, a guy gets rushed up to the major leagues 
and he's not quite ready. I mean, we saw with Eli De La Cruz last year, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, someone as talented as he is, he kind of came up, took the league by storm, and then the league adjusted, and he ended up finishing with a 700 OPS. So that's that's not what you want for a guy like Pajes, who who does factor into your future of of the of the club. If he was just a, a guy who just you you just want to see what he has now, then you do it. Um, but he is going to be a part of this this team, this organization for a long time. And I and the Dodgers are all in now. So I hear what you're saying, Juan, about now. The, the, you know, it's fun and it's exciting to try to make Pajes happen. And I'm I'm actually quoting CB there. He says, "Please stop trying to make." <laughs> I have to show the other side. Who's someone who doesn't agree with Michael Carrillo? He says, "Please stop trying to make Pajes happen." And he says that uh, he disagrees and he thinks you need a veteran presence. So. I feel like we're, we've covered where the Dodgers are now, what they have to look forward to. And again, we're just so spoiled as Dodger fans. We've got options. That's what we should all just be focusing on. We've got options, everybody. I have to call out a super chat. We love the super chats. Keep them coming. Adrian Rodriguez, he didn't ask a question. He didn't want his comment to be, he just sent us $1.99. We love free money. Hey. We love it, Adrian Rodriguez. So I'm going to read one of your comments. It says, Alicia, you look great. Glad to see you. Oh, what? Uh, Prince of Darkness. Oh, that that comment, here. huh? <laughs> oh, I just got to read one of his comments. <laughs> hey, hey, Juan, real, real quick. So I wanted to ask you about, about um, Vargas, because I, mean, I mean, I know it's been a couple of games, but he's like, he's turned it up again in AAA. And that's kind of what he's always done when he's been there. Yeah. I mean, is he be, is he becoming the next like Michael Bush? Like, what are they going to do with him eventually? I mean, they're probably going to have to move on from him, right? No, I don't think so. I mean, I I think again, he's another one of those guys who came up last year and struggled, and everyone's like, get rid of him. And then you look at his like, you know, Baseball Reference picture, his MILB.com page, and he's 24 years old. And then you're just kind of like, oh wait, why do we have to get rid of this guy? He's only 24 years old. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we saw James Allman last year; he was a 25 year old rookie. Uh, going on 26. So it's, I, I don't think it's necessarily time to move on from some of these guys. Uh, eventually, you are going to have to see him do this at the big league level. Uh, but just moving on from him right now, just to move on from him, that seems a little irrational. And who knows? He might he might like left field, and he might be the starting left fielder for the, of the future. That, that we don't know. Uh, if you look at the depth chart right now, like the only outfielder on the roster that's going to be here for a long time is James Altman. Everybody else is on a one-year deal. So uh, you have to keep your options open. Uh, and, and, again, that's that's the whole part of trying to win now while also trying to keep your window open for as long as possible. Uh, and to keep that window open, you do need guys like Vargas, uh, Michael Bush, you know, to a certain extent, um, and, all those, and kind of all those prospects that, that follow through. But – you need those veteran guys in, in, at the big league level, like Hayward, uh, Kike, right? Like, if, if in, a, in a, I guess in an alternate universe, you could have given Andy Pajes or Vargas Kike's spot, but you know, Kike knows what to do in the playoffs, and that's kind of what this team needs. Mm -hmm. And he keeps it light, right? Like he's kind of the relief if it gets too stressful. He keeps things light. I like that. We, we like seeing the Dodgers have fun. You know, they're playing a game like let's keep this going. Um, I really want to remind people that um, your super chats are available. Just hit that super chat. And Denny Cortez, we love Denny. Thank you for joining us on the lives. Her bro is listening or watching from Alaska. What's up, Alaska? I bet you Alaska's colder than where Juan is in Chicago. That's true. <laughs> but there's no baseball there. They get it right, right? <laughs> um. I also wanted to bring up how she called you. She got excited to see you, Denny Cortez. Juan Toribio, a legit sports writer. Yay, her exact words. So that's pretty cool. Oh, thank you, thank you. I don't know about legit, but I'll take it. Yeah. I know. I'm like, wait a minute. But I'm not a writer. So <laughs> It's all good to have you guys. Please keep the comments coming. We love that you join us every week here on our Bleed Lows podcast live. I have to get into it because this happened right after Otani. He finally hit his home run. I know some people were nervous, but for the most part, you know, especially Canelo, the voice of reason, he's so calm. He's like, he knew, he knew Otani was going to eventually hit the home run. If I, I, and, I, and the way Dave Roberts talked about it afterward, the way everybody talked about it, it's just a relief, you know, to just get that done with the first home run. 
But there is a little bit of controversy, a little it's something kind of provocative that happened after Otani hit his first home run into the pavilion. A woman didn't catch the ball. She picked up the ball. We get it because there's a lot of that, too. Like men are upset that a woman that we're saying a woman caught the ball. But I digress. It sounds like she, the person who caught or was the owner of Otani's home run ball. I'm trying to be very specific with my words here, gentlemen. Please bear with me. They, there's some discrepancy with what happened after she received the ball and what she left Dodger Stadium with as a reward of sorts for giving Otani his first ball as a Dodger, a home run ball. Guys, any thoughts on that before I keep rambling? <laughs> yeah, I'll let Juan go first. See what he thinks about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can go. You can go like a bunch of different ways, right? First of all, like, I mean, it was her ball. She kind of, she can kind of do whatever she wants with that ball. Like, she doesn't owe that to Otani. She doesn't owe that to anybody. But on the flip side, you know, every other sport, like if, if when the basketball goes into the stands, people got, have to give the basketball back, right? Like yeah. the tennis ball, uh -huh. they have to give the tennis ball back. The football, you have to give it back. So baseball might be the only place, the only sport in the country where you just kind of keep the ball. Uh, in the world, really, because in, in soccer, it's kind of the same the same thing. So, you know, you can also make the argument that that's Otani's ball and that's just that's his property and whatever. I mean, she's a much better person than I am. I would have asked for at least a Porsche. <laughs> um, okay. So wait. So before I should have I should have explained. Um, I, I don't remember her name. I'm sorry. And I've been reading her tweets and stuff. The woman, the Dodger fan that caught the ball, she received from Otani for returning the ball to him, one signed cap, one signed bat, and one um It was two ball. caps, a ball, and a bat. Okay, two caps, a ball, and a cap. There you go. Thank you, baby face. And they're signed. So there was even some concern where they signed. I mean, that's a bounty, right? However, the stories try to ch it change a little bit. And Canelo and I, we were speaking earlier before we went live. It sounds like everyone has an opinion on this. Juan is in the group of, I would have asked for more. And I'm more like, I feel like she might've been pressured because the story is now coming out where she was kind of wrangled in by Dodger security, taken away from her boyfriend or husband and made to, and just left alone to deal with this like excitement and pressure and adrenaline. And I don't know. I mean, I guess she's, she did say right after she was fine with it. Right, Canelo? But now is there a story change or... I mean, everything I've read from the article on The Athletic by Sam Blum it, and everything I'm seeing on, you know, on social media, it seems like from the get-go she was fine with the exchange. Um, it just seems like you know, now after all the comments have kind of been circulating for 24 hours, I don't know where The Athletic got their number for saying some estimators value the ball at like $100,000. I don't see how that's accurate at all just because I get Otani is who, is who he is. And then the first home run is really significant in his career as a Dodger, but it's not like it was the first home run of his entire career. It wasn't like a 300 home run ball. It wasn't hell. It wasn't even Albert Pujols 700 home run ball that was hit at Dodger stadium. So I don't know, but I just know there are some crazy Otani fanatics out there that will buy some of this stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I'm in, in, in terms of if it was me, I I'm like one of those guys that's like kind of agreeing with Juan, you know, it is kind of Otani's achievement. It is his ball. Like I'm not going to be hard to get to get give him that. Um, so I, I kind of just read the story and I'm like, I don't really care because it's like she <laughs> caught the ball and she got four things from a, a guaranteed, pretty much a guaranteed Hall of Famer. And now she, if she wants to make the money back, she can resell it. So who am I to judge? You know all this stuff. It didn't happen to me. So, but right. I, I but, think I think the big thing I'm taking away. Canelo, you will agree, though, that there are a lot of those comments you mentioned. Let's get into those comments. A lot of them are like, you should have asked for this and you could have got that. And and Pobrecita, like, you know, she's just so excited. And, and I'm I'm with her. I think I'd be fine. I want Otani to have his ball. But could she have left like another fan did for, with uh, whose ball did they leave with? My goodness. The pool holes one. I'm the pool sure holes ball. And holes. someone left, like the, he just got the ball and left. Like, so I feel like the Dodgers didn't want a repeat of that. And this ball's very special to Otani. No one is judging what she did, right? All of us agree with it's her choice. One started off his 
comment with it's her choice <laughs> it was her ball yeah and i, I will say this I, I think it's a story because it was shohei otani right like i yep. like everything else in his life and that and this is coming from someone who has to cover him on a daily basis now like i mean he got married it was a huge story like <laughs> when every other player gets married nobody cares they just say congratulations and then you kind of move on like this guy gets married and it was like i had to write like 600 words on it Everything he does is magnified, and that's just the reality of his life. That's just the reality that comes when you sign a deal for seven hundred million dollars, uh, deferred or not. Uh, and that's just kind of what comes with, with, with the territory, right? Like that's just the reality of of his life. And I think that's the only reason why this is even that big of a story. Maybe that's I've never caught a ball, so I don't know. Maybe this is protocol. Maybe this is just what they do with everybody, and then yeah. just, this is just the way it is. And you're just not, you just don't have reporters asking how was your process because reality is nobody really cares whether she gets two balls or a hundred million, like a hundred thousand dollars. It's just, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. Well, someone, someone commented, Adrian Rodriguez said, uh, she got cool merch. I would have asked for season tickets for life. Uh, I mean, I get I it. Of course. Dude, go said with Porsche. Porsche. <laughs> yeah. Porsche, number one. I, there's she another. Yeah, I know you're right. You're right. Get that Porsche, and it was electric. Um, one thing, another uh, angle to this story that the uh, author Sam Blum, Sam Blum, yep, yeah. yeah, Sam Blum wrote was something to the effect of Otani's interpreter misled the media on accident. It's not a you know we're not trying to villainize anyone here by saying that Otani met with her, and now um, the owner of the ball. Well, the previous, the first owner of Otani's home run ball is saying, no, I didn't. I did not meet him. And that was kind of like, uh-oh, like the flip-flop stories. And so d does that, is there any merit to that? Or was it just a misunderstanding? Well, I, I think it would have been impossible, right? Because we we actually talked to Otani maybe seven minutes before after the game ended. So unless she was in the, in the clubhouse waiting for him to get in there, it, it was just going to be impossible. And at that point in time, he had already said, yeah, I got my ball back. Mm -hmm. Um, so it would have, and if she didn't meet him, it was for like 10 seconds and that was it. If she had, had that part of it been true. So I think there was definitely some, you know, Will probably said something that, you know, he mistranslated something. And I, I think yeah. people need to understand too, like, like I'm bilingual, right? And I've had to translate for, for people in Spanish and it's hard. It's not mm -hmm. like, and I'm fluent in both languages and it's not that easy. Just, right, just right. because you understand it, like you have to like capture what this person is saying and then translate it. And in Will's case, like you're doing this for an entire like continent, right? Like, <laughs> like yeah. you're doing this for the entire Asia. Like you have all this pressure on you. Um, so I, 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 you know, if if he did say something that he wasn't that Otani didn't say, uh, I personally kind of give him some grace for that, just because knowing yeah. how difficult it is. I agree. Uh, but I do think it would it would have been impossible for them to have met. Uh, at least for more than a minute or two, because, you know, the team kind of like toes and they, they have their little dance party in the clubhouse. And then he okay. immediately came right after that. Uh, so timing wise, it, even even regardless of what Will had said, it probably would have been impossible. Yeah. <laughs> I like what <laughs> Heidi JG just said. Just give him the ball and shake his hand. Lord. <laughs> Again, this was like a hot topic all day about, you know, what happened? What did she get for the ball? People are asking for Porsches and season tickets. <laughs> Canelo. Oh, I, 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 well, the, the, the thing, too, is like, so she wanted it to be authenticated, right? Like, that yeah. was the whole part of it. I mean, if, she, if you want to keep the ball, then just keep it, regardless if it's authenticated or not. Because if you want to authenticate, it's probably because you want to sell it or you want to get something out of it. Yeah. So there is, there is also part of that, that side of the story, too. And I, I don't know. She got a, a couple of baseballs, a bat. Well, I'll tell I'll tell you guys. I was telling them earlier. So it kind of depends how how do you want to do it? Like, okay, you caught the ball. Are you gonna sell it? Like, I don't think it's gonna sell for that much money. Like they were saying, maybe a couple thousand bucks. Maybe somebody. But it won't sell though if you don't authenticate it. Like, no I mean, I, I'm sure someone will still buy it. If someone saw that you know she caught it. That's the ball. Someone's gonna buy it. But the other point of it is like, okay, if you if you would have held on to it, how much money? would that go up in value right now she got a ball you know bats right and some hats i was on ebay so balls anywhere go from <laughs> 200 to like a thousand bucks probably for otani? for otani that i've sold not just what people are asking for that are they are authenticated actual... that's the big question 
I mean, you can also if even you can take it to a to someone that will you know get get the authentication. It's different though, bro. I like I understand because like like I collect baseball cards and it's like if I have a card graded by like someone else like a third party compared to like a PSA ten, there's like a dramatic price difference when you get something authenticated by mlb because i don't know if you've ever seen it. i talked to one of the guys that does it at systems bank park literally when you walk up to where they're usually by like the like the camera well by first base you walk up to there they find the exact pitch the play everything and then they stamp the ball and then i think it has like a qr code on it that way if you scan it with your phone it'll take you to mlb what mlb.com's website with their film vault and it'll show you that exact pitch or whatever it was so that's what brings it up. That's like where I'm like when the athletic quoted the ball as being like a hundred thousand dollars, like some crazy fan doesn't have to be in the U S could just be some Otani fanatic in Japan or around the world. Some multi-billionaire probably would have, could have just bought the ball for that much. Well, I mean, that's the whole my, thing about it. I was like, I saw that. I saw the fan for that, that photo of that guy. Someone would have bought, bought it for a hundred dollars. Yeah. See, my question is, okay. Okay. So you got these, these, you know, the balls and the hats, right? And the bat. I mean, if you hold on to it, Otani becomes a Hall of Famer, right? And down the road, right? As a Dodger or whatever. And you got these things. I think those are going to go up in value. You'll probably have, even, I don't know, a couple grand right there. So, I mean, it depends. Like I said, when 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 do you want that money? If you want it like now, okay, you're just trying to get rid of it. Or you want to hold on to it for a while. And then I'm sure the value is going to go up. Yeah. Dang, we're now going down this, um, this rabbit hole of, of balls. Dennis Gonzalez brings up, did anyone ever come forward with Kirk Gibson's ball, his home run ball from the 88 World Series? And people are going off on like, no. I don't think that's, no. that was ever found. Yeah. Someone's, found someone's man cave. That's where it is. Lost to the ages. <laughs> but Juan, Juan, I know. I don't know. Do you want to still hang out or you got you got to go and, and do your thing or... I, mean, I don't want. I don't uh, want to keep you if you. If you got, if you yeah, unless you want to kick me out, if you want to. Kick no, me out. If, if no. you want to hang on, we'll, we'll be. We'll, we're gonna go probably to the top of the hour, and then. We'll, you know we'll what, Juan? Get... We'll we'll segue. We'll get away from the Otani. You know, I'm tired of talking about Otani scandals on this entire show, or whenever I go on social media. So we'll talk about a superstar not named Otani. Let's talk about Mookie Betts. Mookie um, Betts. You recently sent out an email um, in your one of your posts, kind of highlighting. Betts' transition to shortstop and how a lot of people, not even just fans, but people around the league are just trying to say like, hey, like this shouldn't be possible. Like, I don't really think this is a long term thing, but Betts kind of perceives that the complete opposite. He thinks he can play shortstop at an elite level. We obviously know what he can do with the bat, but just how rare is it? what he's doing is it in today's game? And then just kind of do you have faith in Betts to play shortstop for the foreseeable future do you think the dodgers pivot yeah i mean i think i mean to be completely honest with you i think if i said when the dodgers told us that mookie was going to be the shortstop that i wasn't like what <laughs> i mean i would be lying i mean it, it, you're you're basically taking the best right field to, honestly when he, when they moved into second base i was just kind of like this is outrageous like he's the best outfielder in the, the right fielder in the game yeah you're taking that strength away to put him in second base where you know, numbers said that he was just kind of average last year. Uh, I think we all just kind of like fell in love with the fact that he was doing it. He wasn't all that great at second base. He wasn't bad, but he wasn't great. Uh, in right field, he's like unbelievable. Yes. Uh, so just seeing that when they first moved into shortstop, I was just, I was one of those people. I was just kind of like, eh, I'm a little skeptical about this uh, because it's not that easy to just plug someone in a shortstop. It doesn't matter if you're a great athlete. Uh, it's kind of like throwing your best athlete in like the outfield, right? Like we saw Gavin Lux. Who was a great athlete? Uh, they tried him out in center field, and he almost like broke his neck, you know, <laughs> running into the wall. Uh, so it's not it's not always that easy to just put a good athlete somewhere, and, and, and it just works. Um, but over the last couple of weeks, I mean, honestly, seeing him on a day to day basis is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I appreciate you highlighting that article. I actually learned a lot from him, and just kind of talking to him for that, um, because he just kind of said, like, "Dude, I sucked at right field when they first moved to the right field. I sucked." You know, people forget he was a second baseman back in the day, second base shortstop. Um, and he was just kind of like, nobody ever saw that, though. Nobody saw the, the balls that I dropped in the outfield when I was trying to learn that. Nobody saw my footwork. Nobody saw that I couldn't throw like an outfielder. Uh, the only one that saw that was me in practice and early work and, you know, during BP. And then he turned himself into a great right fielder. So he's just saying, like, this is exactly 
exactly what I did back then. And it's exactly what I'm going to do now. Uh, so I think after kind of that conversation, I was like, oh, this is, this, that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it's not always going to look perfect. You know, we see it five hours before the game and him and Miguel Rojas and, you know, they're kind of walking through some things and some of the plays look bad. Like, I mean, that's just they're, they're being honest. Uh, but then he'll make 10 in a row that are really good. And then he'll make one bad one and then he'll just stay there and he'll just do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again until he gets it right. So now I don't think this is a plan that the Dodgers want to have for the next six years, right? Like I think eventually they are going to have to get a shortstop. Uh, uh, you know, everyone talks about William Adams, right? Like that's just kind of the the easy name that comes out there. He's a free agent at the end of the year. Uh, kind of the last option to lock up a shortstop for, the, for, for a while. But I think for this year, I think Mookie can can definitely get it done. I think Miguel Rojas right behind him. Uh, and then who knows? Maybe Gavin Lux at one point in his career figures that out. Uh, but I think for this year, just seeing what he can kind of do on a day-to-day basis. And the, this is the most important part. He loves playing shortstop. Yeah. And when Mookie – three years ago, Mookie told me flat out, before he made the move, uh, and this was just me and him talking in the, in, the, in the dugout, he was like, dude, I'm kind of bored of right field. And I was just like, what? But you're so good at it. And then he was even talking about like he doesn't even like running out to the out, to the outfield anymore because it just kind of bored him. Uh, and I think that translated into him having somewhat of a down season offensively uh, because he was just kind of not maybe bored is the wrong way to, to put it, but he was just kind of like, I know I can do this. I, it's not that much of a challenge for me. And I think for a guy like him, a challenge is good. And I think that's why you're kind of seeing this. Uh, this production that he's had at the play because I think he's he really enjoys playing shortstop. He enjoys the, the challenge of it. And I think the Dodgers made the right move. Yeah. I think just looking at it face value, I thought it was really interesting because if you look at his hitting stats, in terms of MLB, he's like first in everything. So he's got it going right there. You look at defensively, he actually leads or is tied with shortstops for defensive run saves at, I think, three right now. But his fielding percentage is still a little bit under league, you know, uh, league average, which is around like 980. He's at like 966, something like that. Um, But it is unprecedented. Like you said, you know, he is a self-made outfielder. He got called up to the Red Sox when they had, you know, one of my favorite players, Dustin Bedroya, man in it down there. So he had to learn it on the fly. Now it's kind of funny to see the parallels. Now it's kind of reversed where now it's like the team needs a shortstop and we need Mookie Betts to play shortstop because we already have corner outfielders corner outfielders are a lot more easier to replace than a a middle infielder so i have a ton of faith that he can do it but i'm trying to remember who brought it wrote it over the winter but one of the names that piqued my interest then and i kind of threw it out there as maybe a bold prediction if this team implodes that's bo pachette um, this is a guy with the Blue Jays. He, I I they, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it was I, you. I read all your stuff all the time. You're one of my favorite writers. So, uh, that was, yeah, I mean, the he's idea of Bo, yeah, yeah too. the idea of Bo, um, it feels like the Blue Jays are going to have to pick between one of these guys, between Vladdy, Bo, um, and who they're going to pick down there because it seemed like the one guy that they were okay throwing a lot of money at was Otani, and they were said, okay, well, we didn't go to Otani, so we're going to play penny pinchers now. So we'll go off of that. But I would like that idea but if Betts is the guy at shortstop at least this year i think it'll be fun and and i will say this i think there are going to be games where mookie looks bad at shortstop right and i think we all have to just understand or a play right like he might just make a play and it, it clanks off his glove and it doesn't look great but i will say this i think he deserves a lot of credit for even doing this yeah. because if i was mookie Betts, right six-time gold glover former mvp you're already moving me from right field to second base and it's mid March. And you're telling me, Hey, we want you to play shortstop. I'm going to be like, hell no. <laughs> like I've never done this. Like I'm not going to go out there and embarrass myself. And instead of him th- taking it as like, I'm going to embarrass myself. He kind of took it on. I was like, okay, like nobody thinks I could do this. I mean, th- there were probably teammates, right? Like no team has actually said this, but there were probably teammates that were kind of like, wait, we're going to move Mookie to shortstop. And he looks just fine. You're on mute, Alicia. Mute. <laughs> Sorry, the puppies were loud. Uh, Mookie Betts is my bald king, Mad Lad. That's from Mad Lad. I love it. I love it. Keep the comments coming. Thank you for joining. We are Bleed Lows Podcast Live. Don't forget, you can also super chat so the rest of everyone else watching and listening can see the comment on our super chats um 
is it just am I having like a a brain? I thought Mookie did make a comment, a kind of not so excited about playing shortstop in the very beginning. And I wish I could remember what writer, I'm pretty sure it was the LA Times, but I, I, I took it as Mookie was upset that they that the Dodgers were signing him up for shortstop without talking to him. Am I just making things up? No, I think he was, I think he I I think at first. He was probably kind of thinking like, "Why are we doing this?" Because and and people also need to understand that Kim and Lux have a pretty good relationship, right? And it was like four games in, into spring training that they just kind of pulled the plug on Lux. On Lux, and Lux wasn't very really happy about it. And nobody could blame him. Like he worked really hard to try and get into this position, and then four games into the Cactus League play, they're just kind of like, "Eh, never mind. We're not doing this." Uh, so at first, like you know, at first I think even Mookie was kind of like, "This this kind of sucks." Like. You promised me I was going to play second base, and now you're moving me to shortstop. But at the same time, I think Mookie also had some say in that decision, right? Like, they wouldn't have done anything if Mookie would have just said, I'm not doing that. Because uh, the last thing you want to do is piss off Mookie Betts because then your whole season, you know, gets destroyed. You don't want that. So I think the the, the key was for Mookie to sign up for this. And like I said, I think he does deserve a lot of credit for that because I don't think a lot of superstars – you know, this is something like Ben Zobris did, right? Like, just kind of like a utility guy who's just trying to hang on in the league. Not a superstar. Superstars don't do this. Changing a position for a superstar is not that easy. Uh, so I think people should probably appreciate what, what he's doing. Albeit, so, like I said, some plays aren't going to look great. Um, and ultimately, we'll see how he does over the course of the season. But just putting himself out there is pretty incredible. So and just a reminder, the Dodgers have the two best hitting shortstops in Mookie and in Rojas. And I'm, I'm sorry to write down right. the name. But Rojas, what's wrong? Rojas, um, I think, is underrated. I, I, I like that we have options. Again, back to the beginning of the Bleed Lows podcast when we went live. It's like we are just – it's a cornucopia of options and talent. And, and I'm just trying to focus on the positive and – and I like that we got away from the Otani drama, but I'm going to ask one more question that might be considered dramatic. And because we have Juan Toribio here, I have to ask it. It's obvious that Mookie is excelling because Otani is hitting behind him. I get it. I know. However, can this translate into the postseason? Because that is Mookie's Achilles heel, right? Can no? I mean, that's going to be. That's that's for everybody, right? For for the for the four stars. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of putting Will Smith into that this category as well. That's if they hit 50 home runs each in the regular season and they go over in the playoffs, nobody cares. Right. Like their season is a complete failure, and they've right. they've acknowledged this. It's like whatever happens yeah. here, it's not <laughs> great, but you have to win the you have to win, and it's not even like win around. You have to win the World Series. That that's what that's what you signed up for when you spent over a billion dollars in free agency, right? Like. You, you don't spend that type of money on a guy like Otani and Yamamoto and all these guys. You have to win the World Series. Uh, what if and they just hard. get there? What if they just get there? Is that enough or they have to win it? They have to, uh, we'll see. It, it depends how it depends how it gets there. But I think they, at least for them, they have to win it. That's how they feel internally. Um, but I, I, I do think, you know, if Otani goes over, we, we've never seen him in the postseason. We don't know what, what that's going to look like. Uh, you know, we've seen Freddie kind of had his struggles last postseason as well. It wasn't just Mookie. Mookie kind of got the, the, the most of it because he, he went hitless. But Freddie had one hit. Uh, and then ultimately, it, it, yeah, Mookie is going to have to show up in the postseason. Uh, and I think I think he heard and saw everything that people were saying about him after that, that loss to the Diamondbacks. And I think maybe for the first time in a while, he was kind of like, ah, people are kind of doubting my ability. Uh, and this is someone who finished second in – MVP voting last year, uh, and I do think I do think Mookie is, a, is a, the type of player who feeds off of those type of things. Um, I I think he's kind of you know he's accomplished a lot over the course of his career. This might actually be the longest he's gone without winning a World Series in his career, right? Like he came up in '15, I believe it was like full time, and then he won in '18, and then he got traded to the Dodgers, won in '20. That's like this is like four years, <laughs> a four year gap. It's like the first time in his life he's had a four year gap without winning a World Series, so. Um, I think he is pretty motivated to accomplish that this year. But again, we will have to see it. He's going to have yeah, to do yeah. it. And he knows that. And that's ultimately what him, Otani, Freeman, 
Yamamoto, Glass now, all the key stars on this team will be graded on. It won't be what happens over the next six months. Yeah. I would say in terms of like personal accolades before the postseason, I think if Betts plays shortstop at least like for 140 games, like around that number, and he puts up anywhere close to the numbers he put up last year offensively, he has to like run away with the MVP, right? Yeah, it might be unanimous at that point for sure. Like his war is going to be through the roof. You know, Acuna is playing right field. Uh, Harper is playing first. Tatis is playing right field. I mean, you're playing shortstop for the for the Dodgers for 140 games, and you're hitting 40 bombs. You'll probably win that one. And I think it's like me and my friends were talking about this a little bit earlier because if you look at the really good hitting shortstops, they're either average or sub like subpar at defensively. Like we we went through the Trey Turner experience. He's a great hitter, but he's kind of like an average fielding shortstop the really elite guys that you know are good with their you know hands movement feet all that i know miggy Rowe is like hitting well right now but he's typically not a career like he's not the guy you went up there swinging the bat with the game on the line right but that so i feel like that kind of helps him play shortstop a little bit because it's like i don't know why people are expecting him to be this you know win gold glove first year win an mvp win a silver slugger like as long as he just plays average defense which so far he is like he's just gonna run away with it and the the big thing they have to watch is just his health yeah and i i do think like eventually he is gonna have to calm down with the you know pre-game work five yeah. hours before the game uh i don't think that, that that's sustainable for this for six months uh they might have to like drag him off that field though uh because it, it i mean he seems to really enjoy it but uh, yeah, like you said, I don't even think it needs to be elite defense. I mean, there's only a handful of guys that play elite defense in the in, at shortstop in the league. Um, you know, you have like Lindor. I mean, Adamus is kind of in that in that on that boat at, at this point of his career. But Miguel Rojas, as great as he is defensively, I mean, there's a reason why they moved Mookie Betts to shortstop, and it's because you know Miguel Rojas is. I don't want to say a liability offensively, but he's not going to put up the the production. Lux is at second, and Mookie is at short. Uh, so they just need average defense, and they're probably going to out-hit everybody else because, you know, it's not just Mookie Betts. They have Otani and Freeman and Smith and Muncy and Teoscar going right behind them, too. Okay. Mute. Mute. I'm mute again. <laughs> I'm so Rookie. sorry. I'm so sorry. I just want to keep this going, all this offense talk, um, but I do have to get to some of these comments. Uh, Miggy Rowe has been hitting the cages with Canelo. Is that what the rec is? This is another rec reference. Your whole league? rec league reference. You yeah. Met, Roger rec- mentions one time <laughs> yeah, that I'm playing baseball or whatever. And then and, Denny and says, it's just my identity now. <laughs> yeah. Like, Denny <laughs> says, we need an update on the rec league, Canelo. So, uh, I mean, your, your audience demands an update. <laughs> Are we Don't in they the know? I live on the East Coast. It's cold here. You know, it's cold up north. It's cold on the East Coast. We go out once 60 degrees hits, then I'm like, yeah, it's good to go out. <laughs> well, speaking of the cold, I cannot not ask Juan Toribio about his predictions for this upcoming. If you're just joining us here on the Bleed Lows podcast, please make sure you subscribe and like our live chat. Like our live chat. But Juan Toribio is, is hanging out with us while he's in Chicago. And I want to know what your prediction is. How you think it's going to go for the Dodgers on this road trip? Six games, correct? Yeah, three here and three in Minnesota. Um, Burn. I'm not sh- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm not sure. I will say this, though, like not to dodge the question here, but I am going to be interested to see how they react on the road. Um, you know, we kind of we saw the love at Dodger Stadium. You know, every, every, every game had a pretty good crowd. I uh, sold out last game. But this is the first time they're taking this show on the road, and it's not going to be very nice. Uh, it's not like it, it, it's never been nice when you're, you know, when you're the Dodgers. But I think now, especially now that you have Otani, uh, Yamamoto, and kind of those guys, uh, I think people really hate the Dodgers. <laughs> what do you get, think the reaction is for Otani? Oh, uh, he's going to get booed, and it's going to be the first time in his life that he gets booed. Yeah, because I, I think even last year, right, like when he was an angel. First of all, the Angels were, like, harmless, right? Like Even in Chicago, though, aren't they, like, the friendly confines? No, that's not true. See, that, no, that's for them. They only like them. They're not very nice. Uh, I mean, they're not, like, it's not New York. It's not Boston. 
Uh, but it's not, not very Philly. <laughs> it's not Philly, right? Philly's like gross. I've um, been to a Philly game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's getting he's getting booed when he comes to Philly. But so. he's gonna get booed everywhere he goes. And I think probably like I said, it's the first time in his life. Like we saw the All-Star game when Seattle, you know, they start chanting, come to Seattle, and everybody loved Otani because everyone's trying to court him. Uh, it's like LeBron when LeBron was a free agent, nobody hated nobody hated LeBron when he was about to be a free agent the first time. Then he signs him with the with the Heat, and then everybody hated LeBron. Villain arc. Um, so I think this is just what's gonna be the case with Otani, uh, and it will be interesting to see how he handles that. Like I know he probably likes to be liked. Everybody does, um, but those days are over. So I, I'm I am excited to see how the whole team as a whole reacts to that. Uh, Cody, you are another expert on cold weather since you do reside in the East Coast. Do, is this something that we need to be concerned about? Is the cold weather also? I mean, I guess it's not baseball weather, but. For the B I, writer, you got to be concerned. I'm going to die. Yeah. It's going to be too cold. <laughs> Yeah, especially when they probably open up those press box windows so you can see the game. I don't think you're going to want to be in there. So. I, was, I think I was telling Roger this. Like, so when you're the when you're the road, some kind of like uh, press box etiquette here, like when you're the road beat writer, you just have to do whatever the home beat writers want. So sometimes they actually do want the windows open because they say it's a beautiful day or whatever, but it's like 37 degrees. That's not beautiful. But I can't say anything because, uh, again, they're the home beat writer. So I just had to like, sit there quiet cold uh and it is as miserable as it sounds but right. we really get you some, some hand warmers and some yeah. feet warmers i have them for hiking i also used them when i went to see a mariners game which it's right off that water that chill but i don't i guess because you're in the press box at least when i watched a game in boston and in seattle they would bring hot chocolate to your seat or like clam really? chowder yeah they, so, they don't really like us. <laughs> they actually they want us gone. I know, right? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> they pay money for those seats. Like they they like you. They, us, they don't like us. I I have not been to Wrigley. I I it was I was gonna go this weekend, but I got in my accident, so it's okay. Next, hopefully next time around. So I'm gonna live through you, one. I'm living through you. <laughs> I'll, send you I'll send you pictures. I'll send you pictures. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I just want to catch up on some of these comments. Um, oh, the Dodgers have always been hated. Beat LA is a common chant. Losers hate winners. I mean, this is the trip then to get Otani's skin a little thick, right? This is probably, I guess, if you're looking at the yeah, silver Minneapolis, lining. Yeah, Minneapolis is really nice. But again, yes, the, the, that comment is correct. Everybody does hate LA, right? It's like you know, New York, Boston, it's kind of the same thing. But this is going to be a little bit different. Because now, like, everyone's really upset that Otani joined, you know, the super team. Everyone kind of wanted him to be like this. I don't know what they wanted him to be. But that just kind of comes when you build a team for stars like this. So I, I, th I, I think there's going to be the natural, you know, we hate the Dodgers. We hate LA. And then there's going to be, like, we hate Otani now. <laughs> like, so it's going to be a combination of those two things. This trip won't be that bad. I mean, it's going to be really cold. So if people are, like, booing at 30 degrees like yeah. i'd be concerned oh, yeah. but you know they go to new york twice in the summertime when they go to san francisco it's gonna be get pretty bad san diego is gonna get pretty bad um so we'll see how they do it you're gonna how do you think cold breath right well boo you're gonna see like the cold <laughs> i guess it warms you up so they might just boo all game how do you think the cubs, how do you think the cubs look i mean they they lost two to three of the rangers right then they swept the rockies right it's kind of expected I mean, you think you think they're a threat in the in the in the central, or? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think everyone's probably a threat in the central. I mean, I don't think there's there's a clear cut winner there. Uh, you know, it'd be good to see Bellinger and Bush and Yancey. Uh So, kind of seeing some of those guys will be kind of cool again. And and they have Suzuki, who's really good. Uh, Imanaga looked great his first start. Uh, granted, it was against the Rockies, but he looked really good. Uh, so yeah, I think they I think they have Justin losing steals. A, a big deal. I think he would have started tomorrow, if I'm not wrong. Um, so losing him is a big deal for the Cubs, but uh, I think between them and the Reds and the Brewers and Cardinals, and then like the Pirates are like, they actually look really good too. So that division is going to be kind of interesting to follow. Everyone needs the bad guy. So I think they uh, sounds the consensus from our comments 
they want Otani to embrace being the bad guy. I mean, he has no choice from what Juan, Juan is saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's going to be interesting, right? Because, like, it doesn't seem like he is a bad guy, right? Like, it doesn't seem like he's kind of like the the villain type. But maybe, I don't know, maybe it does come out of it and, and then it'll be kind of cool, right? And, you know, they are in this is another situation, too. Like, people are going to start screaming, you know, gambler, right? Like, that's just, mm -hmm. it's going to happen because people are, you know, people are mean. <laughs> like, people yeah. are. People don't care about like facts and or anything like that. People are just gonna shout whatever they want to shout. Uh, and he is gonna have to hear that for the first time in his life, as opposed to how great he is. Uh, so I think you know, like like uh, Cody said, when he goes to Philly and he goes to some of some of these other places that are like pretty bad. Uh, the one good thing is though, he doesn't play the outfield. He doesn't play the field, so he can just go out and hit and not have to hear it. like Tatis, right? Like Tatis had to hear all the all of the steroid yeah. stuff. In the outfield for nine innings, like Otani just goes out there four times or five times a game and then waves at everybody and then leaves. So that should help him too. What what I'd love to see him do is you know hit a home run, he's rounding the bases, bases you know pull a Hulk Hogan, kind of put his hand to his ear or or you know do the do the money or the or the jock thing, right? Kind of like maybe like a, a, what he really should do is kind of get like a sponsorship of like DraftKings or fans <laughs> or something. <laughs> Hey, he's round in the bases. Bet just responsibly, dude. Bet responsibly. <laughs> bet responsibly, exactly. <laughs> Theme of the show. Uh, here's an interesting comment from CB. Altman hits in cold weather. Do we want to bring... I was trying to keep this positive. Altman does have one hit, right? And, and congratulations to our friend of the carne asada. James Altman and his wife are expecting a baby. Yay. Um, but do should we be concerned or is it just too early in the season? I think it's too early. I think if you look at his, you know, expected numbers, they look okay. Um, I think he's going to get hits. Altman strikes me as a streaky hitter. I mean, he's not the purest, you know, of swings. He, he kind of, we saw last year, he went through some cold stretches and he went through some hot stretches. I think the big thing for me is that we're not paying Altman, you know, to be like the star of the lineup. We're paying him to play sound defense in center, which he made, huge strides in last year. I know everyone remembers that play in center field in the first playoff game, but he is a really good defensive center fielder. And I think that's the big thing about his game. He's going to, he has power. He's going to get on base and he did hit well in Chicago last year. So maybe this could be a waking up for him. Juan. Yeah. I mean, I think he's going to be a guy who, you know, he strikes out a lot. Yeah. Uh, that's just part of his game. It's kind of like Teoscar. Teoscar is going to strike out 200 times this year, and people are going to start freaking out. Uh, and Altman's going to—I mean, I think he was fifth or sixth in strikeouts last year. Uh, so he is a guy who strikes out a lot. He's going to have stretches where he looks kind of bad at the plate. Uh, but like Cody said, I mean, he's—he's he smoked a couple of balls yesterday, uh, right at the first baseman or right at the right fielder. So eventually, he is going to get some to drop. Uh, maybe the lack of pop, like pop, like pure power. Maybe that's a little bit more concerning. Uh, he, you know, he's a 20 homer guy. Uh, but like Cody said, if if he plays good center field, there's plenty of guys in in that lineup that can produce some 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 runs. Well, again, I'm so jealous that you get to be there. It's one of the cathedrals of baseball. I've not yet experienced is Wrigley. I had planned on being there, but you know the God, God or my creator had different plans. So I'm going to live through you. I want to see these pictures. I'll send um, you a picture. Yeah. And tell me what you eat too. I, I don't know. Maybe you need to leave the press box to have yeah, some yeah. of that. Like, there's like a good burrito place, like right outside of Wrigley. So I'll send you that Ooh. picture. Too. Yeah. There's like, um, there's like puros mexicanos there, right? There's a lot of Mexicans in Chicago. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, the, the burritos. Oh shoot. Today is national burrito day. Woo, Juan bringing it up. Yeah. <laughs> the man of many talents. Um, thank you guys for all hanging out. I, I don't want to keep you. It's late there in Chicago or later than here. And it's cold. We want you to get all snuggly. <laughs> Somebody keeps asking if you are watching Shogun, Juan. And, and Cody, too. Are you guys watching Shogun? Should I be watching Shogun? I've heard good things. I just haven't had time, you know, to sit down and watch Hulu. So... Um, but I heard it was a good show. <laughs> yeah, no, I've never heard of it. It's on Netflix, right? Or Hulu. Hulu. Yeah. Oh, Hulu. Okay. Because I watched The Brother's Son, and that was really good. So if it's 
like anything the like main, that. The main the main actor in it throughout I think the first pitch the other day at Dodger Stadium. I forget his yes. name. Oh yeah. Japanese right. actor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Oh and I, I think Otani Maybe I'll and watch his it. wife Otani and his wife mentioned they watch it, right? Or Otani spoke for her and said that they're watching Shogun, I believe. So okay, so I guess we gotta watch it because Otani's watching it. <laughs> We got to keep up. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap up so we can let our guest, our special guest host this evening. Thank you, Juan. I hope you had a little fun. And yeah. I hope you join us again. This has been so amazing. If you all are just join us, joining us here on the Fluid Lows podcast live, the other Juan, the Prince of Darkness, as um, well, obviously, hasn't been here. He's on assignment, and we'll let him know that you asked about him, and he will be joining us again soon. Thank you all for joining. Please subscribe. Please tell a friend. Please like our our chats. And don't forget that if there's something that you really want the world to see, you make sure and you super chat it, and it'll be right there in color. Thank you to Adrian uh, Adrian Rodriguez this evening for super chatting with us. We've got to keep that Japan fun going, man. Actually, now I'm thinking I want to go to New York in this summer, even though summer's in New York. I'll oh, be there like, for the Yankees series. So, <laughs> hey, we could do a field trip and meet up with Canelo and see his wreck in person. <laughs> you don't want to see that. <laughs> come on, come on. All right, thank no, you guys. I, I, I <laughs> um, please, uh, like I said, subscribe, like, tell a friend, and we will join you next week. So make sure you hang out with us. Thank you, Juan. Well, yeah, of we'll course. Thank you guys for having me. Um, this. This episode was brought to you by Bet Online, where the game starts. And that is in no reference to Shohei Otani. I'm just making sure that we keep it level. Bye, you guys. Be safe out there. Good night, Dodger.